Hello everyone, my name is Frank. Welcome to this video. In this video, I will present a case study on the use of hyperspectral remote sensing to study hydrothermal alteration systems in the 3.2 billion years old Archean volcano sedimentary sequence. It shows very nicely how subtle differences in the chemical composition of white mica minerals play a key role in the mapping and recognition of a hydrothermal system developed in the Archean times. It also demonstrates the potential for hyperspectral imagery to identify zones where deposition of metals occurred during the time of hydrothermal fluid circulation. The case study is based on research from the past that I jointly conducted with CSIRO in Perth, Australia. So the title of the case study is Tracing Fluid Pathways in a 3.2 billion years old volcano sedimentary sequence with hyperspectral remote sensing. First, I'll show you a map uh, with Archean and Proterozoic crust throughout the world uh, to can indicate the area where the research was, was carried out. So that's here in uh, Western Australia in the Pilbara Crater. What you see here on the right is a landset color composite of Western Australia. And in the upper part of it here, you can see a very typical pattern of bright um, semicircular domes. And these are granitoid complexes and uh, some greenish areas in between, squeezed in between these domes that are greenstone belts. This is the Pilbara Craton, uh, consisting of, of Archean rocks. In this case study, we're going to have a closer look at the Strelli granite, which is a small uh, granitoid here uh, in this area, uh, with on the eastern margin uh, a series of, of greenstone uh, sequences. On the left here, you can see a geological map of the area. Um, the greenstone belt with the intrusive underneath it has been tilted and uh, recently eroded, which leaves us a very nice cross-section through, uh, through the Archean crust. In the, geolo in the geological map, you can see um, the greenstone belt here, which consists of volcanic rock. It is overlain by sedimentary layers here, and uh, it's intruded by, by a granite, an Australian granite, and a series of uh, mafic, ultramafic dikes. And there are also a few stars that, that you can recognize here and here and here and here. Uh, and these mark uh, massive sulfide deposits um, that were formed at the Paleo seafloor and which is now marked by a chert called the Marker Chert. This whole granite greenstone terrain is approximately 3.2 billion years old, as I already said. And uh, this area is very special because uh, geological textures and structures have been exceptionally preserved. It's quite amazing what, what you can see. And I'll, I'll, see, I'll show you some examples uh, of it later on. Then on the lower right, um, you can see a cross section or a sketch of the situation uh, during um, um, deposition of, of, of the massive sulfide deposits. We're here in a submarine environment. Um, so in blue, that's the, that's the sea. And then uh, there is an, uh, a paleo uh, a sea floor with volcanism. And within the sequence, uh, there's also a series of, of uh, volcanic deposits. And below that, uh, you can see uh, a series of uh, granitic intrusions. Uh, so you can imagine that this is an, an environment with lots of heat, uh, steep uh, geothermal gradients, uh, and, and a lot of fluids available. On the left here, you can see an aster image, a color composite of bands four, six, and eight. So these are uh, shortwave infrared bands. Um, and in this uh, particular color composite, uh, you can recognize hydrated minerals in red. So all the red, reddish pixels, they, uh, they do uh, contain hydrothermal minerals. And you can see that there is this quite an, an, an accumulation of it here in this uh, near the top of uh, the volcanic sequence and here in the south as well but also near the top of the, uh, the strelli granite you can uh, you can recognize uh, hydrothermal uh, minerals um, 
Yeah, so these deposits are, are massive sulfide deposits of the, the VMS uh, type, volcanic massive sulfide uh, deposits. And um, on the lower re uh, right, you can see a conceptual model of, of how these deposits are formed. Um, yeah, so you can see here an, a paleo or a seafloor um, with a heat source, uh, which is the intrusion. And what happens here is that uh, water within the, uh, the seafloor is heated and uh, di discharged uh, at hydrothermal vent sites um, and where, uh, because of uh, steep physical chemical gradients, uh, the massive sulfides uh, deposit. Um, and um, well, you get so this is a sort of fluid convection that that occurs in in this in the seafloor, and there's seawater, cold seawater recharge uh, away from the vent, yeah, and that it's uh, percolating downward into the into the seafloor, and then it gets heated and then again discharged again uh, uh, at the hydrothermal vent sites, and while circulating through the uh, volcanic stratigraphy, uh, base metals are, uh, are being picked up. Some, uh, some evidences of this in the field. So what you can see here are uh, fossil hydrothermal vents. Here in, in the middle you can, you can see one. Yes, so this is quite a uh, beautiful delicate structure that has been preserved. Um, and you can see that, well, they, they, they look quite similar to, uh, to what we nowadays see. Um, at the mid, uh, mid oceanic rise, yeah, uh, so there are also uh, there's active hydrothermal venting um, where also massive uh, sulfides are being deposited, but where there are also abundant uh, uh, forms of uh, of life. So they're interesting sites, and um, this is evidence that 3.2 billion years ago this already occurred uh, on, on in the uh, on the Earth. Another interesting texture is uh, or structure are uh, fossil uh, pillow uh, la lavas or basalts that we can also find in the field. Um, in, this, uh, in this photograph here, you can see uh, these, uh, these circular structures. Those are your pillows. Uh, so most likely um, extruded uh, lava uh, in a submarine environment. So by interaction with the water, you get these, these nice pillows. And this, this process we can also compare with, uh, for instance, uh, recent eruptions in, uh, in Hawaii uh, underwater where also these pillows uh, are being formed. Uh, interesting about the, the fossil uh, pillows here are that they are completely altered to quartz and sericite. So all the, the mafic minerals have been, been completely replaced, which is an evidence or an indication uh, of, of extensive hydrothermal alteration that occurred in the uh, in the volcanic rock in the area. And also they, they contain micro uh, bio biomarkers, so which is also interesting from an, uh, uh, an origin of life point of view. Okay, so then uh, we can pose uh, the following question. Can we find indications of hydrated minerals with remote sensing? Because that would be interesting. Eh? And then not only as I showed with Aster, but in much more detail. So can we find indications of hydr hydrated minerals um, with high resolution remote sensing imagery? And can it also tell us something about uh, the hydrothermal processes that, uh, that occurred in the past? And therefore, um, a high map hyperspectral images were, were acquired from this area, um, largely, well, mostly from the, the, uh, the, the greenstone belt. So that, that's here and here. Uh, and uh, w w what you see here are four strips. Um, so four images that have been flown. And they're here, they're imaged in such a way that uh, they simulate natural colors. And well, if you look at the image, you can see that it's basically greens and reds and so, some, some, some pale, palish colors. Um, yeah, and that's exactly uh, the colors that you also encounter in the field. So we, we can see some photographs here. Uh, the green is uh, mostly coming from spinifex vegetation, which is pale green. Uh, sometimes they're small because they have been, uh, they have been, there are often 
uh, fires, bushfires, so then all the vegetation burns. Uh, but after some time, the uh, the bush uh, con well start growing again and continue to grow. So in parts it's quite dense, in other parts it's uh, uh, it's more sparse the vegetation. Um, I like the sparse uh, sparsely vegetated areas because the spin effects is is quite terrible to to walk through because they're very well because of the needles they stick uh, stick to your legs. Anyway, uh, there's also abundant iron. So uh, the rock is, is coated by, by, by iron because of weathering. Uh, but the nice thing about this area is that the weathering is not very deep. So it's just a surficial layer. Uh, and that makes it uh, a good area to study with remote sensing methods because you don't have to deal with thick uh, laterite uh, cover. Um, so this is a an, uh, an zoom. Zoom, uh, zoom in into one of the areas. It's a kangaroo caves area, it's called, named after the kangaroo caves. Uh, VMS occurrence. Um, it's indicated by this white star. Yeah, you can see, you can recognize the volcanic sequence here. Uh, so it's near the top of the volcanic sequence. Uh, above it is a series of sediments and below it is the granite, so which, is, which is fractured. Um, and we're, we're going to have a look at this, uh, this spot here, uh, this yellow, uh, the yellow dot yeah, from this uh, from this image, you can see that there is uh, the rock is quite pale, um, paler than, than, for instance, uh, the area adjacent to it. Okay, one note is that uh, here you can see the straight line, but that's just the the, 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 the border uh, of this uh, of one of the images. So there's not really a seamless uh, uh, seamless match of the two images. But that's okay. We we, we know that, so we we are not going to interpret that as a, as a fault or so, of course. Right, so um, the photo in the upper right is a photograph, field photo of this area. And you can see that the rock, it's a volcanic rock, it's an andesitic, you know, it's an, a, a dacitic, uh, dacitic rock. You cannot recognize it from, from, from this distance, but it's, uh, it's broken, it's uh, bleached, and it, uh, it looks pretty much, uh, pretty much altered. And we can take a thin section and study that, and this is then what we see. Um, you now we can see a volcanic uh, texture with an agglomerate, agglomerate of, of uh, feldspar crystals which have been completely altered to, uh, to sericite and quartz in a matrix which is finer grade but which also consists of uh, a sericite and quartz. So it's, it's completely altered rock but uh, the original texture is still uh, visible. Uh, this, uh, this is just a refresher. Uh, I was talking about my, white micas. Well, muscovite is a uh, potassic white mica. It's, uh, it's a sheet silicate and it's, uh, the crystals are formed by, uh, by, by sheets, thin sheets made of uh, silicon uh, tetrahedrons. Um, yeah, as you can see here, and they form a nice, uh, a nice network. And uh, in between there are octahedral layers and interlayer and interlayers, and in the octahedral layers, you can uh, find aluminium, iron, and magnesium, and that's important because uh, the amount of, uh, well, the relative amounts of the, these uh, elements, they can be measured with remote sensing methods, which is quite, uh, quite amazing. The other thing that's important is that um, the mineral is hydrated, so it contains OH bonds, and whenever the OH bonds are, are I bound to aluminium, iron, or magnesium. Um, yeah, then uh, this particular bond absorbs uh, electromagnetic radiation in the infrared, and that's uh, something we uh, we measure in this case study. So let's uh, let's continue. Um, in the field, we have set up a nice uh, field lab with uh, with a portable infrared mineral analyzer here, a PIMA, and a laptop, and a series of rocks that we've measured. Um, the rock that were, was, was collected from this particular site that we have already looked at um, was also measured and a reflectance spectrum is uh, shown on the lower left on, with on the x-axis uh, the infrared uh, uh, wavelength between 1300 and uh, 2500 uh, nanometers and on the y-axis is the uh, reflectance from 0 to 1. And if you are a little bit familiar with reflecting spectra of minerals, then you can uh, recognize uh, the mineral muscovite here, uh, potassic white mica. Um, and well, this is quite uh, quite diagnostic. We have an OH uh, absorption feature here. 
near 1400. We have a relatively shallow water feature near 1900. A very prominent absorption feature near 2200 because of aluminium hydroxyl bond. And then we have two overtones that's uh, uh, longer wavelength. Uh, Wavelengths. Yeah, so this is very typical uh, reflectance spectrum of muscovite. And then, of course, the question is, can we also measure it with uh, the airborne hyperspectral data? Uh, first, a little bit about the concept of, hi of hyperspectral uh, uh, data. So it's image data, it's flown by a plane. Um, and then um, yeah, we collect images. And then if we want to say something about the, the rock mineralogy on the ground, we have to compare than the pixel that is corresponding to the site that we're investigating. Um, unless normal photographs, uh, yeah, this with hyperspectral remote sensing, a large number of uh, images are acquired at the same time uh, of one area. Um, and it, it's a stack of images where each image is an, a measurement of the uh, reflectance uh, of, the, of the ground at a different wavelength. So what you can do for one pixel, you can uh, take all the different uh, re uh, reflectance values at a different wavelength and you can uh, plot them in an XY plot, as you can see here. And in that way, you can reconstruct the reflectance spectrum. Yeah? And you get the same kind of spectrum as we saw before in the previous slide, but with the difference here is that uh, uh, the atmosphere absorbed some of the radiation of the water features, especially near 1.9 and 1.4 micrometers. So those features you cannot study very well, but the ones between 2 and 2.5 and micrometers you can, you can study. Uh, and that's exactly the, um, uh, the wavelength range where we have the aluminium hydroxyl uh, uh, absorption feature of, of muscovite. So let, let's then see uh, how that works out in this particular test site. Yeah, we were still in the same uh, area. And now we're going to uh, extract the reflectance spectrum of the, uh, of the pixel that corresponds with this site from the imagery. And that, that uh, spectrum is then shown here. Um, okay, the, uh, the y-axis is, is uh, differently calibrated. So it's not, not between zero and one, but it's between uh, uh, zero and uh, and a hundred thousand. Um, but on the y-axis we have okay we have wavelength in micrometers in the in, in the reflective spectrum below it's in nanometers but that doesn't matter very much. Um, okay and then we have the atmospheric bands here and here so this one these two we, we have to ignore but if we go to longer wavelengths we can see that there's a very clear absorption feature near 2.2 which is the same as this one at 2200 and we have we can also see those two overtones and yeah, that we can also recognize here in the reflective spectrum uh, measured on the ground yeah, so this this confirms quite well that we can measure muscovite from a distance with the hyperspectral data and even better uh, we can also uh, measure uh, uh, subtle shifts in, in the wavelength position of this uh, feature at 2.2 micrometers. So I'll show, I'll show that, what that looks like in, in a minute. Um, yeah, so this is again the, the natural color composite of the, uh, of the kangaroo case area. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you um, the different white micas. And then we get an image like this. And so this is quite colorful. Um, well, as I said, yeah, we look at the uh, we look at the wavelength position of the 2.2 micrometer uh, feature of, of muscovite, and it can vary. So here, this position can vary between 2,200 and 2,215. Well, the, the muscovites with a shorter wavelength position, they are aluminium rich. So this is uh, aluminium in the octahedral sites and they're shown here in blue. Uh, the muscovites, which have a longer wavelength position uh, up to 2,215 are shown in red and they are more aluminium poor where the aluminium has been replaced by iron and magnesium and that weakens the bond and therefore uh, there's a ship shift of the, uh, of the wavelength position, of the, of the absorption wavelength. Um, so the color shows you here the type of white mica or muscovite um, in blue and red and so a little bit in between in yellow. 
but there's also an intensity difference. So some pixels are black and otherwise other pixels are, are very colorful. Um, well, this is um, uh, because uh, of the depth of the absorption feature. So what was done is the color of the wavelength position was fused with uh, an image of the depth of the absorption feature. And whenever the depth is, uh, is zero, there is no white mica and then the pixel becomes black. And whenever the, uh, the feature is deeper, then uh, the pixel gets an, uh, a brighter color. Okay, so that uh, that explains this these colors. Um, well, if you look at the uh, the, the patterns, uh, you can see a lot of interesting features. Yeah, like for instance, um, near the top of this uh, of the volcanic rock, yeah, all the rocks contain aluminium-rich white micas here and here, and then uh, on top of it here we, we see this black layer, yeah, and that is here and here. So that's a chert. That's the marker chert, and you can see that the deposit, the uh, the VMS deposit, or occurrence, I'm not sure if it's a deposit at all, it's maybe too small to, to call a deposit, uh, is, is positioned on this, uh, on this chert layer. Um, if we then go deeper into the pile, we, we can see that there is an abundance of, of more longer wavelength micas, but just below the, uh, the deposit, you can see that there is a cross-cutting feature yeah so this is an, uh, um, a zone where there is less less white mica um, and well if you would do further investigation you find that there's chloride so this is an al another alteration zone which cross cuts the, the stratigraphy and which is uh, characterized by chloride and, and quartz a very little white mica uh, and this zone extends here near the bottom of the of the volcanic pile as well. But then if we go f deeper again towards the uh, granite, uh, first we can see that there is uh, some abundance of, again, uh, aluminium rich white micas, uh, which is probably related to, to a higher temperature mica here. And then we uh, you end up in the granite, which is also quite, uh, quite intensely uh, altered and fractured. Uh, and all the micas there, they are of the longer wavelength uh, type. So then the question is, how do you now uh, make sense of this? Eh? So how can we interpret uh, the patterns? Um, well, based on uh, a lot of measurements, um, geochemistry, uh, oxygen, isotope, atopic ratios, which uh, were used to uh, calculate uh, alteration temperatures, um, and, and, and other types of analysis, uh, we came to the, the following uh, interpretation in terms of fluid uh, pathways and fluid patterns. Um, so logically here we have the, the discharge side. Uh, so the, this is was part, we think it's all part, uh, 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 partly related. I mean, the distribution of minerals is all related to hydrothermal alteration because all the rocks are, are very strongly altered. Um, but, but the patterns, they, they relate to the position in the in a convective hydrothermal system that altered, uh, altered the rock. And as I said here, you know, here we have the, the discharge zone, which is, is, is underlain by this chloride quartz, intensely altered uh, uh, zone, and just, just below where the uh, deposits, uh, massive sulfide deposits were formed. And further away, we get an, an, a recharge of, uh, of seawater into the pile, uh, first at low temperatures, but then uh, gradually the fluid chemistry is changed um, and, and also the temperature increases, so we get a different type of white mica. And then uh, even further, uh, when the uh, fluid chemistry changes uh, and evolves and temperatures increase, we, get, uh, we end up in the chloride quartz alteration zone. Yeah, and that is also uh, visualized here in this conceptual model. Uh, where you can see the, the fluid um, the pathways and the relationship with the type of alteration. Um, okay, and here in the upper right, there's another, uh, also the relationship between, in this case, uh, spectral mineralogy uh, and the, the aluminium content of white mica uh, is shown um, and, and, and together with an, a fluid pathway uh, where you can see that uh, where there's recharge occurring, uh, we get aluminium, um, 
rich white mica and a very little chloride. Well, and then whenever you uh, go deeper in the pile, we get aluminium poor white mica and, and, and then if you go even further deeper, the chloride content uh, increases. Um, okay, and well, one observation we can make is that, that probably the uh, recharge must have occurred before the third layer was, uh, was deposited because uh, a third layer will probably block and make the, the, the seafloor impermeable. Okay, um, there are also other uh, models that, that could explain the distribution of, uh, um, of alteration minerals, uh, but, but we prefer this, this interpretation. Uh, however, there is still a big, big question mark whether there is any contribution to, uh, uh, from uh, magmatic uh, fluids. Yeah, in purely VMS type of, of hydrothermal systems, then uh, most of the fluids are from um, seawater derived. But uh, in this case, there could also have been a magmatic uh, component coming from the, from the granite, but that is not, not, not clear. Okay, so um, now we can make the same kind of, of, of minerals map for, for, the, for the other four strips or for the, for the four all four strips, and then we get an image like this, uh, with lots of uh, systematic uh, variation of colors, uh, uh, white micas, and uh, there there seem to be uh, a typical patterns associated with most of the uh, the uh, VMS deposits, like here. This is Sulphur Springs. This is Kangaroo Caves, and there are three more. There's one here, and one here, and one here. Uh, but in general, the situation in the south looks a little bit different than uh, the situation in the north. Um, why that is? Well, maybe the, the conditions were, were different. What you can also see is, is this onlap of, of, uh, of sediments uh, on top of the, uh, well, the, 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 the chert layer which, which occurs here. So, so perhaps uh, the onlap occurred uh, already quite early in the, in the development of the hydrothermal system and therefore um, uh, you get uh, different conditions and a different distribution of hydrothermal minerals. Okay, but that is still not, that's not clear. But you can imagine that this is, this information is quite useful if you are exploring for, uh, for VMS deposits. Yeah? Because the, the spatial patterns that are visible in the white micas, they, 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 they point you to some of the, uh, the discharge zones. So, okay, this is the last slide. Um, I'll end with a summary, uh, three points. So the first is key hydrothermal minerals can be identified and mapped with hyperspectral remote sensing techniques. Uh, that, that, that's important and that is typical here in this area. Doesn't mean you can do that everywhere. If there is a thick lateritic cover, things are quite, quite uh, well, different, more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult. And if there's abundant vegetation, then also uh, it becomes much more challenging to find your and map your key hydrothermal minerals. White mica minerals are formed, uh, formed under specific conditions, pressure, temperature, and fluid chemistry, and therefore their occurrence in the rock record can be used to reconstruct and constrain paleo conditions. Uh, and the third bullet is uh, mineral maps may provide insights insights into the hydrothermal processes that affected the volcano sedimentary stratigraphy and can point to mineralized uh, discharge zones. Um, there are a couple of publications uh, on, this, uh, on these studies. Um, one I can recommend is, is this one here that appeared in Geology in 2005. Um, but there are more, more publications uh, on the topic. Um, and finally, I want to acknowledge or thank uh, CSI RO Australia for providing uh, the high map data. Okay, so this uh, concludes the talk. Thank you all for watching. I hope you found it uh, interesting and uh, perhaps inspiring. And I hope to see you again uh, some other time. Goodbye.